Okay. So I can see attendees hopping in. Good afternoon. Okay, good. Okay, good afternoon. We are going to get started in the next minute or so while we are waiting for folks to log on. Let's get to know each other. Drop your business name and what you do in the chat box. Uh, I would love to see who all are there with us in today's webinar. Let's get started. I will share my screen. Are you guys able to see? Okay. Good afternoon again, guys. Um, welcome to today's webinar, Meet the VC with Joshua B. Siegel, acronym Venture Capital, presented by Early Growth. My name is Kushbu. I am an even marketing manager with Early Truth, and I'll be your host for today. Some house, housekeeping uh, rules for you. Uh, this webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the time for Q&A at the end. You can place your questions in the Q&A panel at any time. This webinar will be recorded and sent to all registered friends within 48 hours of this presentation. You can also find the recording in all of the previous web webinar recordings on our YouTube channel. The link to it will be sent to you uh, via recording email. Okay, before we get started, let me tell you something about our early growth. At early growth, we have got the entire finance stock covered, stack covered. What that means for you is really two things. First, you have got strategic partner in growing your business our CFOs with their years of experience and dozens of startups under their belts help you see what's coming on, good or bad, and take advantage of it. From strategic decisions to fundraising, they have seen it all before. Second, our CFOs, senior accountants, and tax advisors take care of all of the blocking and tackling related to day-to-day, year-to-year, and month-to-month -month of your finances so that you can focus on your business. Both early growth and our CFOs have been around the block a very few times. We have helped and served over 5,000 clients coast to coast around the world, approximately 40 countries. As always, our CFOs have helped our clients raise billions of dollars. We would love to help you and serve you as well. Now, something I would like to tell you more about, like we believe in, we believe in delivering the peace of mind by providing you all one-on-one -on -one solution for all of your needs and requirements, including CFO services, HR, accounting, taxes, and insurance. We'd like to protect you for your profitability by giving you a sole point of contact for, to answer all kinds of questions and strategic dashboard to help you understand your business better. We want to be your partner in growth to help your business grow by working at the back end so that you can focus on growing side of your business. And something special for you all, we have a promo running. It's not too early to start planning your 2022 taxes. You want to get a provider in place before the end of the year so that you can plan effective tax planning before the year ends. We have a promo running to help you with that now. You can get $500 off on your 2022 tax preparations. Just hop on to www.earlygrowth.com forward slash tax promo. Now, something interested to engage you guys, we'd love to do that. To kick us off, I want to do a quick poll question to see who's in the room. I'm launching the poll now. So you guys can, uh, you have 30 seconds to fill in the poll as per your 
answers and it will be interesting to know your thoughts and then I'll be sharing the stats with you. 15 more seconds left guys. I can see answers. Okay. That is it, sending the results now. Okay. So I have shared the answers with you all. All right. So hopping on to the next, the most important part of early growth is our partners. Your team is critical to your success. And that's true whether you are building a startup or putting together a great webinar. We have got a number of great startup, uh, great partners in the startup community, but for today's event, it's the best of the best. Early growth has always been focused on the team, the community. We know that together we can go further. To bring you today's webinar, we have a startup dream, dream team. Hey, to tell you more about our partners, we have our moderator, Michael Carolina with us. Michael has been a business development manager and director, private equity sale and early, with early growth in Escalon for over three years. Prior joining to early growth in Escalon, Michael was a sales consultant at Trident and founded first casual restaurant, first casual restaurants in New Jersey. Michael is an ardent traveler and an avid golfer. He has an impending trip to Ireland to pursue both of these hobbies. Yes, Before an impending trip to Ireland as long as I don't mess this up completely over the next 30, 40 minutes or so. So we'll see about that. But uh, thanks so much, Kushbu. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks for the introduction. Nice to meet everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and yes, as you mentioned, before we get into our, our chat with Joshua, the VC today, I'd like to introduce our partners really quickly. Um, they're going to share a little bit about themselves, their company, what kind of value they bring, uh, and we're really excited to have them today. So first, we'll start with Lauren Schroeder from Robank. Lauren? Hi, thank you so much for having us. Sure. Uh, it's great to see you both. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Lauren. Um, I'm the Director of Business Development here at Row. Row offers a automated spend and cash management solution, integrating commercial cards, um, banking, uh, accounts payable, and, and more all under one roof. So we work with hundreds of companies from early stage startups to middle market businesses. Um, so if you're looking for new ways to maximize your working capital uh, or looking for a new corporate card or, or just alternative bank, um, I'd love to have a conversation. Um, I'll post my, my email here in the chat. Um, but for any of you companies out there, especially going through the exciting round of, of raising your seed, um, please let me know if we can be helpful. Thank you, Lauren. Appreciate that. Next up, we have Shane Baramalay from Perkins Coie. Hi there, guys. Uh, Shane Bramley. I run a, an investment banking group, essentially, within a law firm. So what we have is a unique platform that's a free service for clients. We work on everything from pre-seed all the way to private equity. So our main goal as part of our group is to help clients raise capital, uh, extend their businesses, scale, build out their teams. Uh, in addition to this, I also founded an impact investment group called Carbon. So I kind of wear a lot of hats but our goal is here to really work across industries and connect the dots. Thank you, Shane. And third, Guy G and Pedro from Extensus HR, one of our PEO partners. Thanks, Mike. Yes, my name is Guy G and Pedro. I'm with Extensus HR. We are a professional employer organization platform where we work with small to mid-sized clients, really in, in four specific areas, payroll, um, employee benefits, workers' comp, and HR. Um, the, the concept behind it is a, a shared employment relationship in which we are able to access benefits for the entire group that come under our common employment umbrella. Thanks, Mike. You got it. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate you joining in and sharing a little bit about your companies. Um, great. Now to the main event, uh, Josh Siegel. Um, VC, general partner at Akron and Venture Capital, extensive experience in software, tech, real estate, 
luxury lifestyle, digital media, and consumer product goods. Um, prior to joining Acronym, he was the general partner at Rubicon, a very well-known US VC um, at Citicorp, Citibank, um, and was also with Overseas Private Investment Corp. Just went through his whole resume there. Um, <laughs> he began a few years back, became an active invest, angel investor um, in some companies that you might very well know if you take a look at that list. He went to BU uh, with an MBA from Georgetown and also has a degree in gastronomy. So um, a very well-rounded Renaissance man we're speaking with today. Josh, thanks so much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. My pleasure, Michael. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Um, we're, we're excited to pick your brain for the next, you know, 30, 40 minutes or so. Um, we're, we're all so excited to hear about your perspective on venture capital. It's ever-changing present and future. So please uh, yes. start us off by telling us more about you, acronym, and the current state of affairs there today. Right, sure. So you just went through my resume and you can find out, you know, my last 25 years of life on LinkedIn. Uh, basically, we made the transition from Rubicon Venture Capital, which had been around in the New York City venture community really since 2012, 2013. So we're one of the early, probably first 25 funds in New York. And now there are over 300 funds in New York. Uh, we rebranded we re to Acronym Venture Capital when the general partners of Rubicon split. And so now one partners in Austin, Texas has his own fund and me and my New York team we are here in New York and down in Palm Beach. Uh, and so we rebranded as Acronym Venture Capital and started investing in 2020. So we're a $40 million fund. We do late seed Series A, enterprise SMB SaaS for FinTech, hospitality tech, which is bar, restaurant, hotel, travel, prop tech, workflow, e-commerce infrastructure, marketplaces, things like that. And we also do omni-channel consumer brands. So we, we will lead deals, but we'll also co-invest. So we'll do 18 to 24 deals in this portfolio. Uh, we've already been investing for almost two years. We've got another two, two and a half years left of when we feel we'll be completing our investment. We've done six deals to date. We'll do another six to eight deals this year. We'll lead half of them and six to eight next year, and then a little bit more. Um, as a you know, late seed series A fund though, we can only really lead about 40 to 50% of our deals because the, you just can't lead every deal when you're having that much diversification in a fund because we're not a concentrated fund, right? So we require an eight to 10 X return on every single check that we write. So typically, you know, on the late seed, we're getting in at an eight to $12 million pre-money valuation or a cap. And then typically around the series A at a $20 million cap or pre-money. Right. So we're very careful about where we write checks, how we write checks, how much and what we like to see in entrepreneurs and what we like to see in teams and the product and all that different kind of stuff. Very interesting. Um, a lot of different spaces you cover. Uh, how big is your team um, and do you have the in-house experts to you know, <laughs> hit hospitality and all those other channels that you're looking at? We definitely have the expertise. We can't do, we can't be experts at everything, but we know enough to be very dangerous. So I'm an ex professional chef, very connected in the hospitality world. So on the hospitality side of things, we're great. I'm an ex banker. I helped deploy the SWIFT system into Eastern Europe on the technology side, but was also on the capital markets teams. Uh, I am an ex real estate developer for many years after that as well. So we know a lot about a lot of things, and my team members know a lot as well. So we are very good at evaluating stuff. We will miss stuff for sure. And we have missed stuff, but it's rare that we've actually made an investment that has completely failed. Uh, that's one of the, uh, I guess, caveats to how we invest. We don't invest like a San Francisco fund. We invest like New York bankers. We need you to have a real business, right? We need to see real revenue, real customers, real people that are willing to pay for it. Not, I have a good idea. And if it works, it could be a billion dollar company. Uh, we don't invest that way. We want to make sure that we know who's the, who the buyer is, what the psychology is behind it, what the sales cycle is. And so we're really a core team of three. So I'm the general partner. I have a right-hand man named Matt Kalinske, who's the principal. Uh, he's been now in venture six years, uh, working all with me. Uh, and then there's other members of the team. But we, we know what we're doing. Uh, so occasionally, again, we will miss something, but really we don't. We only had two deals fail 
in our last fund out of 24. And we will have seven or eight unicorns in that one fund. So we have two prior funds, but the, the one immediately prior to this, it'll probably do a 25X. That's kind of unheard of. It doesn't yes. happen, mm-hmm. right? right? So I am doing something wrong for sure uh, because normal funds do a two and a half to three X. I mean, you'll have, you'll have great funds that'll do a five X, six X, whatever, but uh, we're doing something different and it's working. So we're happy. Clearly that's an incredible hit rate. Congratulations on that. Um, I can yeah, yeah, that's true. Now you, you set up the success. Now you got to keep it going. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned uh, the part about being a lead investor right now, um, as you're building out this new fund and the new portfolio, you're a lead yeah. investor currently in most of the companies. So does that mean you're going to be two questions? What, what do you look for to become a lead investor versus not? And does this mean you'll have to be taking a backseat in more of your investments going forward? So uh, we will probably lead only another seven or eight deals in total uh, from here. So we've led five, another seven or eight, you know, you're getting up to 12, 13 deals in total, which is about half the fun. Uh, I don't mind not leading deals as long as the parameters of the deals make sense if I was leading. So that's price, that's parameters, that's rights, uh, management, you know, connection, all that sort of stuff. I don't need to lead every deal because I can't, you know, mentor or help the uh, founders in every way possible that I can on a lead deal, right? So as long as I know the VC that is leading and I'm comfortable with them, that I'm totally fine to participate in a deal. We typically always want a board observance situation, but really we're always going to have communication with the founder because we're a value add firm. So even when I'm not leading, we are all about helping our uh, portfolio companies generate revenue. That's what we do, right? We're not consultants, we're not advisors. We write a check and then we help you any way we can. And that is a pre-existing qualification for any deal we do. If we can't help you generate revenue, we are not going to write you a check. It's, it's really that simple, right? We need to know that our connectivity is gonna be helpful. So I'm 49, I'll be 50 this year. This year, I have 28, 29 years of professional experience. I'm connected. I know people. My emails get returned. If you can't get to someone and you're a founder, you call me. I will make it happen. And we pride ourselves in that and we do it, right? So uh, in leading deals, we want to lead deals that we know we can have an outside, outsized impact on. And those are deals that we will lead, right? Um, we also take on special situations where typically a lead investor in New York is doing about a third to 40% of the round. So, you know, if it's a $10 million round, the lead investors expect to put 4 million in or so. It also depends on what your ownership thresholds are. We don't have ownership thresholds. Uh, I know people really want to own 8, 10, 12, 20% of a deal. I don't think that way. Uh, we don't need it. It's not a must have. I don't think it's a good way to invest. And so we don't do it, right? So we just want to make sure we get an eight to 10 X return on every check and we balance the portfolio to that. So I'm not worried about only being a half a million dollar check into a two and a half or $3 million round and leading it if the founder has the rest of the money, right? Because they need money. So we, we balance that. It really, really doesn't matter. But we'll do check sizes, you know, 350 to 750 if it's a million and a half round. And then one and a half to three million if it's like a four to ten million dollar round, right? So we upsize it or lower it. It doesn't really matter. Understood. Thanks. Um, you mentioned the sound process that you have when evaluating these businesses. Are there common characteristics of an exceptional portfolio company that distinguish it from the rest of the yeah. businesses that you're constantly evaluating? Absolutely, there are. Uh, I hate to, you know, use the word thematic, and we don't look for thematic trends in terms of pedigree. Like we don't care if someone's coming out of another type of company or we, we don't care what school they went to or any or YC alum or any of that stuff. We want to see really high level charisma from a founder. And that has nothing to do with looks. Uh, it has to do with your ability to recruit, your ability to sell, your ability to raise capital and your ability to be engaging, right? All those are necessary items of a founder. Now, if you have a multi-founder firm, then somebody who is the founder has to have one of those attributes, right? 
And so it's very important because as a, as a founder, you're going to be able to sell your product or service better than anyone else. So we don't like to see founders raising to say, well, we're going to raise because we need a head of sales because we're not very good at it. Like that's a bad sign. You don't want that, right? So, you know, ability to sell, ability to raise, ability to network, all great things. Ability to recruit talent is a huge element in today's world because it's very tough to find great talent, right? So those are just some of the things we like to look for when we're looking at a team. And certainly the product, you know, you have to have a must-have product. It's got to be compelling. We want to make sure the sales cycle is fairly short. You know, enterprise software can take nine months to a year. That's not awesome. We've done it. We don't love to do it, but we've done it. If it's a shorter sales cycle, that much better. We're going to see that increase in sales that much sooner, and it'll make you more attractive for other investors that want to come in later, right? So those are certain elements that we, that we like to see. And for us, we're always looking for revenue when we make an investment. So typically, late seed series A, we want to see at least a million dollars in ARR, actual trailing revenue, before we write a check. On consumer or CPG, we want to see it closer to about 2 million or 160, 170K per month, right? So we've got to see your ability to sell to strangers. So any founder who's out there or any investor who's out there knows, yeah, you can probably get your MRR up to 15, 20, 30,000 a month with your friends. Well, I'm not investing for you to sell to your friends. I want to know that you can sell to strangers who don't know you, don't owe you anything, but like your product or service, right? That's how we think about that from the software side. Of things. On the consumer side, we want to see that repeat sales because I want to know people like your product. They're not just product discovery and trying it, but they're consuming it, right? It's addictive, not destructive. So that's, those are some of the things that we think about. Makes perfect sense. Is there, um, you know, you mentioned seven or eight unicorns you expect to come out. I'm sure you've had some in the past as well. Is there one that comes to mind when you talk about this <laughs> perfect setup that just worked out the way it should? Is there one that comes to mind you could tell us well, about a little bit? The perfect setup was Daily Harvest, which just became a unicorn a couple of months ago. Uh, you know, I met the company randomly through an angel dinner, and then I went and met the founding team. And they really nailed it. The product is amazing. And I was really, really excited to get involved. That was back in 2017. And it took, you know, four and a half years for them to achieve their billion dollar status. Uh, you know, the company in 2020 did 250 million in sales. Like they're, they're just going up. They're doing fantastic. They've hit all the milestones they need to do. So that was like a perfect line drive setup. It was tough to invest in. Because once we decided to invest, it took time to make the investment, but it was, it was an oversubscribed round. So we were lucky to get in. Uh, and the founder's just been amazing. So that, that's been great. Um, they don't all work out that way, right? Like sometimes a, a, a company will go completely left or right and you know just is not down the fairway. And you're like, what's going on? And so that can be challenging. That can be really challenging. I can imagine. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, I, I've seen, you know, with, with my work at Early Growth and Escalon, with the companies we engage with, we're always hearing about ESG, environmental, social, and governance objectives, um, and these are a big hot button in the VC world today. How does ESG factor into potential investments with acronym? Is it something you consider, and if so, <clears throat> you want to see? So we don't really consider it as a qualifying criteria in terms of like, we, we have to invest in this company because it's, you know, leading the way in ESG. We expect our founders, founder teams, management team and everything to, you know, have diversity, to have equal pay, to have good governance. Like I am a raised, born and bred New Yorker by a very strong, you know, 50s and 60s mom. Uh, unfortunately, is no longer with us, but like she ingrained in me, like fairness, equal opportunity, all that sort of stuff. So we don't think like Valley bros, right? We think like New Yorkers. So we want that equality. We don't look at a startup and invest for a cause though. We are financially motivated firm. We have LPs that we report to. So we are really giving money back. That's our goal to have that finance. But we really don't want to get involved with a founder or founders uh, that don't have the best interests of their stakeholders, which really involves everybody at heart, right? And so 
you know, we don't want to get involved with bad people. We just, we just don't want to do it. Because once you're an investor in a company, uh, it's not like a marriage. There's no way out. There's no divorce. Uh, you can get divorced anytime you want. You cannot divorce a founder and a founder can't really divorce an investor. So you're with these companies for five, 10 years, and then you have history and legacy with them. So you want to work with really good people. It may not always work out. <clears throat> like stuff can go wrong. And that happens, you know, if you're, if you're in VC, you got to be able to take your lumps. But as long as the founders do it properly, it, it may be their fault. It may not be their fault if they don't succeed. But as long as it's wrapped up, you can't fault anyone from that. Like that stuff happens. But it's the way in which they handle themselves and their character that matters to us. If you're going out there to save the world, though, and your goal is to just raise lots of money, do a social impact thing, whatever, we're not your investors. That's not what we do, right? Uh, it's nice if there's this extra benefit, but I want people of good character. Fair enough. Um, the other hot button topic of, I guess, almost the last two years now we're coming up on is, of course, COVID. Um, how have your investment strategies and acronym changed from pre-COVID to post-COVID? Are there new industries and verticals today that are more valuable, important than they were 18 months ago? There, there are definitely a lot of new industries and a lot of the way we work has changed from a day to day because the team is not together on a daily basis. You may get, go on Zooms, be on Slack, emails, calls, but nothing can really replace face-to-face -face interaction especially when you're doing investments and you're talking about lots of different companies and lots of different things all day, every day, every week. Sometimes you just need to pop in and talk and you have a thought and whatever. So it's definitely changed how our process works a bit. Um, there are lots of new uh, uh, you know, technologies that are out there, certainly like the whole Zoom stuff, conferences, they've just taken that to the next level, work from home stuff, cybersecurity stuff. Uh, definitely like restaurant tech, ordering, the way people search, all that stuff is taken off. Mental health is a huge issue. Uh, education is a huge issue. So there are lots and lots of things. The reality though is our core business elements that we look for have not really changed all that much. You can have a new kind of business, but you still need a team, a product, a market, and customers, right? They have to pay for it. So a lot of the business fundamentals still readily apply, right? I will tell you, though, it has become harder to find great companies because you're not doing a lot of the natural interaction that you would do at a random event, at a cocktail party, at a dinner, sitting down in New York at a coffee shop, whatever it is. That doesn't happen as much. And so when you're relying on the Zoom stuff, you will miss things because you can't always Zoom with everybody. Like last night, I had dinner with a few people in New York I hadn't seen in over two years. And since I hadn't seen them, I'm out of sight, out of mind. But now that we've connected again, they're like, I should send you something. So in-person connectivity, I feel is really vital and a necessary element. And you just don't get it on a Zoom. You just don't. I couldn't agree more. And I want to touch on something you said about, about Zoom. You seem, based on everything you've said so far, um, you know, you're very, you like, like you have a sound process when you're making an investment, but you also have that gut feeling whether you trust this founder implicitly or not before making the jump. Has the movement to remote work and Zoom conferences and away from face-to-face -face impacted your ability to, to make those decisions with as much confidence as you might have in the past? It definitely does, because if you can't read the body language of the founder, you might miss something. And when you're talking over Zoom and you're asking for things, if you don't get it, it becomes really a big problem. When you're in person, you can really ask and be like, open up your laptop, show me what's going on, Right. And on Zoom, they can be like, oh, well, I'll get it to you later or whatever. So it requires actually a bit more due diligence. We, we check even more stuff than we otherwise would have. Um, we're still checking numbers and all that sort of stuff. But uh, it is, I would think, a, actually a longer process to invest in a company during COVID than it has been prior. We got to, you know, yeses faster than, than now. Um, that just happens. But we've found some awesome companies as well. We have companies all over the United States and Canada. I mean, we do stuff all over the place. So you, you've you made investments fully remotely with having without having met a founder in person. That's happened? So of the six investments we made uh, in acronym, two of the investments are legacy. I'd already met the founders in person, so I already know them. The uh, 
the four other investments, um, one of them we had met the founder before as well, but the other three, we had never met the founder in person until, until we were already down the investment path. Um, actually, that's not true. There was one other one that I knew the founder from 15 years ago, but we didn't write a check until actually meeting the founders in person. So we always met them before we sent our wire, uh, just, you know, hi, how you doing? Put a face in the name and have a physical contact. We haven't done anything where it's purely virtual, right? Uh, because during the early days of COVID, nothing was happening, but most of our investments happened a little later. So we were able to connect and meet. Uh, having said that, I would do an investment without having to physically have met the founder, as long as somebody has met the founder, right? Yeah, that's fair. Um, you've, you've spoken a couple of times today about having that New York approach to investing as opposed to the Valley Bros. I'm a New York guy too, so I get to say that alongside with you, the Valley Bros of the Bay Area, whatever it may be out in California. Um, do you find that being a New York VC is more or less challenging when competing for new investments? You just mentioned that you have investments across the country. So does your geographical location help, hinder, or have no effect? Well, it does both, right? If you're investing in West Coast deals, then you can't be in New York, right, uh, at, at our stage, because you know, there's 500 VCs, VC firms in San Francisco, probably more like 800 right now. And you can't compete with that because if I'm seeing a West Coast deal, that means 800 people passed for some reason or another. So who am I to get this deal, right? So you got to be careful about that. There's plenty of activity in New York. A lot of New York firms, though, do do deals outside of New York. Uh, a couple of the firms are exclusive to New York, but that, you know, that doesn't really bother me. Uh, we've always looked at deals all over the country, so I don't have that problem. We do try to stay out of San Francisco for the reason I explained a moment ago, but uh, it is harder now that I'm down in Florida because I'm in Florida, you know, 300 plus days a year. I'm only in New York every so often. We do have a team here though, so they're here, but it does make things a little harder to find stuff that we normally would have found earlier. That's a consequence of COVID though as well. So uh, I'm not worried about fun performance as a result of that but I am worried about missing stuff, right? So we just work that harder. We, we work that much harder to not miss stuff. Understood. Um, and to the audience, we only have a couple questions left, wrapping up in a few minutes. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask Josh, just please drop them in the chat or the Q&A um, area, and I'd be happy to walk through them with Josh right after we wrap up. Well, th there's a couple of questions that were sent to me that uh, I'd like to answer, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. So go people for asked it. about revenue growth and ARR and stuff like that. So in late seed series A, you know, we do like to see that million dollars in ARR, which really means trailing million. We can't just have one month of 80,000 ARR and then that's it. Uh, we want a good distribution of customers. So you can't have concentrated revenue with just two or three customers. That's not great. Uh, we do want to see a relatively short sales cycle. Uh, which can be anywhere from two weeks to 120 days. You know, that's fine too. Anything outside of that, you know, longer than 120 days and you get less credit for that, right? We also want to see great margins. So on the software side, you know, we're looking for 80% margins. It's one thing if you're at 70, 65 at the moment and you know you're going to ramp up, but we do want to see those margins approaching that 80, 85%, right? On the software side. On the CPG side, it really needs to be about 35%, you know, uh, fully shipped, you know, cost of goods sold, ship fulfillment, everything. It really has to be about that 35%. On the uh, consumer product, we need to see an LTV to CAC of four to one. Anything less than four to one, you are going to die. Like th there, there's, there's no way to, to cheat the math. If you're a CPG company and you're lower than four to one, eventually you're gonna die, right? So uh, depending on the, the price set, but we really want to be able to see that. On software, LTV CAC also should be more like nine to one, right? It depends on what it is. Founders today really want to see a multiple of 10X on their ARR. Sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. Um, it all depends on where you are in your life cycle and we'll give you that eight to 12 or whatever it is on SaaS, not on CPG, right? And so there are different kinds of multiples for stuff. Churn is a factor. Uh, we don't care about logos unless they're paying. If they're not paying, then it doesn't matter, right? So be careful about that sort of stuff. 
Um, somebody asked about hiring a professional CEO. <clears throat> the only reason why founders are CEOs is because of their founder. Being a CEO does not mean that you know how to run a company or you're a chief executive or whatever, nor do you have to hire them. You can wait to grow into a CEO role. What you need to be good at is sales product, uh, you know, the technical aspects of what you're doing and recruitment. That's all it takes. That really is all it takes. You don't need to be some, you know, high class MBA, Harvard trained, whatever, to run a company. That doesn't mean anything. So I don't want to see a gun for hire running the company because that's a misalignment of interests. I want to make sure the founder is there, they own a good percentage of their company, and their success and the, the creation of whatever money they want is really ingrained with the company. I don't want to see a founder with like two or three jobs, you know, two or three other companies. 100% on the company that we're funding. That's what I expect, right? No chairman, no executive chairman, none of that stuff. We don't fund those kind of companies. Got it. Uh, and then Robin asked, you're only interested in software and not hardware? So we have learned that hardware is really hard, right? And so the challenge with hardware is unless you have experience in supply chain and you understand FCC regulations around hardware and you understand stuff about what it costs and shipping and inventory and delivery and whatever, uh, it's very hard. We have learned that we are not good at that. So we typically will not do a hardware device and hardware is usually a one-time sale. <clears throat> Sometimes there's that extra software with it, but it's very tough. It is very tough. So generally speaking, we don't do hardware and we don't do IoT. It's just not our area of expertise. Uh, from Lee, <clears throat> how do you balance your investment criteria among CPG products and restaurant slash apartment technology or hospitality perhaps? Sounds like there are different revenue and operation models. <clears throat> they are. So CPG is a, typically a consumable, like we're not doing furniture. We're typically doing food and beverage, skincare, things like that. Uh, I would do uh, certain CPG things that might be just one-time sale, but very rarely. And we haven't done one today. So restaurant tech, or any hospitality tech, we want it in the stack, you know, a monthly subscription fee and something that once it's in, it's very hard to rip out, right? So it needs to be a must have type of, of software and something that is really better than anything else out there. So one of the companies we invested in recently is called Marquee and it's restaurant tech and it does that. And once you're in, it's gonna be very difficult to rip them out. So that's how we look at it from the differentiation things because CPG is not restaurant tech, right? Uh, so software is software. Again, tough to rip out, a must have. CPG is like, I drink it, I like it. I'm going to use it every day, every week, and it's repetitive. Got it. My last question, and I'd really like to hear your perspective on this. Um, according to PitchBook, average early stage pre-money valuations have doubled in the past 18 months, while late stage valuations have gone up 4x. Um, I have founders gotten 200 and 400% better at what they do and companies are, are that much more. Well, why do you think that is? And why is there a bubble? And is it going to pop? So I definitely think there's a bubble. This happens every cycle. I've seen five of them. And so it will retract again. There is a lot of venture money in the ecosystem. There are a lot of repeat founders. There are a lot of people that have come out of great companies and therefore it might be easier for them to raise if they already know VCs. So you're seeing like seed rounds, five on a pre of 20. If it's a repeat founder or someone that people know, and they're just like, I want to be in business with you. There are a lot of later stage funds that are now getting in earlier because they have to. And so they're willing to get 5 million on a 20 million pre. We don't do that. Most of our founders are first time founders. So if you're a first time founder, you're not going to get a 20 million pre from me anyway. Uh, we want that alignment of interest. Bigger funds, 250 million, 300 million, a billion. If they're going early, they have to write, you know, a bigger check. And therefore, if they're only 20% ownership or whatever it is, they don't mind getting in at a 20 million pre. I mind, right? My LP is mine. And so um, I've seen it, but we find deals and this will all come back. Like years ago, the VCs had more, uh, you know, uh, ability to pressure stuff. Before that, the pendulums shifted back to the founders. They had you know, more maneuverability. Now it's back, it goes back and forth. But 
The challenge is just because your friend got money at whatever valuation they did, doesn't mean you will. So don't screw up your round by miscommunicating with people. Find the right VC, you'll get your deal, but don't do it at the destruction of the company. Don't be too proud about it because it may not work and you know, you'll get dilution later and you will not be happy. So you got to balance it. Um, I definitely think that there is a no man's land right now after series A a bit. So there used to be the series A crunch. Now there's a series B crunch. So companies that didn't really, they raised all this money early, didn't really get to where they were supposed to and would have to do an A extension, which can be done, but hard. And if they don't get to the series B, the series B guys are like, we don't want to do it. And if they don't have any skin in the game, they don't care. They'll wait to find a good company. Uh, at the growth stage, there's plenty of money. I mean, plenty do you, do you money. think good companies can die from being overvalued early on? I think that they can die, but more importantly, I think that they get a massive dilution round or they might have to do a round where the liquidation preference is very high. So it might appear that they're doing well, <clears throat> but when they exit, they owe a lot of money. So it can be tough. It can be very tough. The other thing is there may not be an exit for them, right? Like M&A is the exit. SPACs are really not around much anymore. A lot of them are failing. And, uh, uh, you know, IPOs have cooled right now. That market will be back for sure. Not a problem. Um, you know, you, you got to be very careful about how you position your company because if you overdo it, you know, you go out for a big round and nobody wants to give you the check, you're screwed. Precisely. Um, all right, I'm set. Looks like we had a couple more questions come through the chat before we wrap up uh, from Leo. What about investing in professional services companies? Is that something VCs are open to? And what are the consequences for founders and their experience? So professional services companies are services companies. They're not technology. You might be tech enabled, but you're going to get a much lower multiple on your revenue. A lot of venture firms don't really invest in professional services company because they're not as scalable because in order to scale, you need more people, right? It's not software. It doesn't scale efficiently. So a lot of them don't do it. We have invested in tech-enabled companies, but typically that's really like a two-sided marketplace. We only give like a 3X multiple on the revenue. We won't give 10X. We just won't do it because it's not worth 10X, right? So you got to be careful about that. Some people will do it. Some people won't. We have done it, but we're not doing it for like consulting. We've looked at like tech-enabled accounting services and things like that, but we don't do like agencies or ad tech or stuff like that. Um, somebody asked a question about if we were slowing down our investments. We are not, but we're not fast either. We don't spray and pray. We are very, very careful when we write a check. Okay. Josh, thank you so much for taking some time to meet with us. Um, I'll hand it back over to Kushbu now, but yes, we would greatly appreciate you sharing your experience and expertise with us. Um, I know the recording is going to go out to everybody on the call, everybody who signed up as well. I know there's some people who weren't able to make it. So this will be blasted out to many, many people. Kushbu, over to you. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you so much, George. That was such an intellectual webinar for today. And I'm sure everyone must have uh, got their answers <laughs> as a desired for. Okay, so for our audiences, you can find us all over the interwebs. Uh, just a reminder, the webinar will be available within 48 hours uh, on our YouTube channel. And uh, all of the registrants and joinees will be receiving our email with the recording of it. Uh, we appreciate uh, you all joining us today. With that note, we conclude our webinar for today. Thank you so much, guys. A really nice day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.